I have not been net short the market. Otherwise, I'd be getting destroyed. I will wait for the time because there's still a tremendous opportunity to make on the on the short side here. It, according to my calculations, the market could still drop 35% from here before it reached something close to fair value. Welcome to Wealthion. I'm Wealthion founder Adam Taggart. Thanks for joining us for part two of our interview with money manager and macro analyst Michael Pinto. If you haven't yet watched part one of our discussion with Michael, in which he predicts that today's market optimism will soon devolve into a major downdraft in price once recession arrives, head over to our channel at youtube.com slash Wealthion and watch it there first. It sets the context for the investment themes we discuss in this video. Okay, let's get started watching part two of our interview with Michael Pento. All right, but now main event, Michael, we've talked about all the challenges here, your, your primary thesis, you've laid it on the table. The recession uh, has been delayed, but it hasn't been repealed. Uh, it is coming. It's highly likely you know, to come for all the reasons you've, you've highlighted here. You have got your proprietary model. Uh, mm -hmm. If you wouldn't mind giving just 30 second refresher for folks on kind of how it's constructed, um, and then talk about how you're positioned now pre the breakage happening and the policy reversal and all that stuff, and then how you plan to react to the breakage. Okay. So I've created something called the inflation deflation economic cycle model. It's a 20 point model. It's a diffusion index and it's based on the second derivative or the rate of change of the rate of change of inflation and growth, 20 components. So, and I thank God for this model. It took me decades to develop. I launched, I launched it officially in 2016. Um, but I really started hone it, honing it on, in the collapse of you know, the global financial crisis. So um, as of right now, uh, I, I think the last time I was on your program, I think it was May. So it was sort of like, you know, mid spring. And I said to you and to your audience, I said, the, infl the recession is nigh, it's coming. It's just not here yet. And I, and I gave some examples as to why the high frequency components of my model kept me from becoming net short. I have not had one day in 2023 where I was net short in the portfolio. And it wasn't because the NFAIB wasn't contracting. F NFIB, the National Federation of Independent Businesses, clearly says a recession is coming. Yield curve tells me a recession is coming. Leading economic indicators, recession is coming. I can go on and on and give you the, the, my models on my website. Uh, most of the components are there. Um, it's just not how I analyze it. So, um, so the recession is coming, but what has not happened yet? I have yet to see, and I continue as of September 11th of the recording of this interview, I have yet to see financial conditions. And I have two index indexes that I look at there. They are actually still easing. I want to see financial conditions tighten before I become more, um, cautious or more hedged in the portfolio. I haven't seen that yet. I have seen yield spreads be between junk bonds and treasuries contract, which is also part of that construct that I just mm -hmm. mentioned, financial conditions. Those are two critical, hypercritical components of what I look at in my model. I've seen the labor market instead of, you know, initial claims starting to tick up. They've stayed, went to 250, 260, and now they're back down to 230, 240. These are the high frequency components, the daily and weekly stochastically stochastic components of the model that let me know when I see the trend, and I guess proprietary measurement of this trend, when I will start to get net short in the portfolio. Right now, as of today, I have two hedges in the portfolio. I have a, a small position, about a 2% position in short junk bonds, I'm short junk bonds, high yield. Um, and that's kind of flat, not really making money, any money there. In fact, I'm underperforming the, the S&P 500 th this year. I, I outperformed it by a lot last year, but not this year, not even close. Um, just, just to be all, in all candor. Um, <laughs> how many, how many, how many advisors would, would brag about that? Uh, yeah. Well, um, and how, how many people, but rea in reality, how many people went all in on NVIDIA, you know, yeah. in January? V almost nobody. Yeah, I, 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 I get it. And the equal weight S&P 500 is up 4% this year. So before right. you, people get, 
uh, you know, ecstatic about seven companies. You take those seven companies out uh, of the index, and I think the index is flat or down a little bit. So it's, it's, yeah. it's the average stock has gone, no, gone nowhere in 2023. Um, I, so I have a, a anti-beta ETF that I own. And the rest, so that's my those are my hedges. If you want to consider gold a hedge, I really don't. But I, I have a 10% position in physical gold, no miners. I sold those months ago. I have no position in long-duration treasuries. I'm 100%... All of my position in treasuries, which is about 67% of the portfolio, is in the shortest duration. So zero to three months or two to three years. So I'm all on the short end of the yield curve. That's where the higher yield is. That's where the less danger is because the Fed is almost done hiking rates. Um, maybe they have one more, mo one more move to go. And then I'm going to wait for those highly stochastic uh, uh, indicators that I just talked about. Will let me know when I need to sell some of the other positions. I'm long healthcare. Um, long aerospace and defense. Um, I mentioned that I was, I was long gold. Um, I am long utilities in a, in a, in a small, a very small uh, position. So basically dividends, safe dividends, uh, low beta dividends and short duration treasuries, nothing long. I'm going to stay that way and continue to underperform and get flack from uh, certain people like, you know, I, I, I've been in this business. I have been li a licensed professional for 32 years in this business. So I come at it from someone who has been around a while. Uh, don't say I look older than that, Adam. I don't, I don't, you don't. Yeah, Michael, you, you do not look old at all. You are extremely. So, so 60 years old, uh, in a couple of days, um, 32 years in the business. And I know when it's time to chase the market. And for all the reasons we spent over an hour on this interview going through, each one independently analyzed without an agenda, we have to remain cautious rather than getting over our skis and chasing a bunch of AI stocks at this point. I will like to buy them. In fact, I have a small position in Cisco in all candor too. Um, but I don't consider that a pure AI play. And it certainly doesn't have the valuation of NVIDIA. So I have, I have safety, low volatility stocks, a lot of treasuries, and I will wait patiently. Again, you can ask any one of my clients. I have not been net short the market. Otherwise, I'd be getting destroyed. I will wait for the time because there's still a tremendous opportunity to made on the on the short side here. It, according to my calculations, the market could still drop 35% from here before it reached something close to fair value. That's a huge... I bet you, of everybody you've interviewed, Adam, no one has told you that. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I don't know. I, I, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to listen to all your interviews. We, we, <laughs> we've, had a, we've had a few that are equally skeptical on the delta between fair value and where we are today. Okay. Okay. So don't be surprised if you see a drop of a third or more from the stock market from this point. Based upon metrics of total market cap, the GDP should be closer to 100. Now it's 165%. So about a third of that value could get wiped out um, and still be on par of what historically should dictate where the where the um where the where the total market cap of equities to GDP should be. Now a lot of this depends on on what Powell does. And remember we talked about that March decision he's gonna have to make. I don't he has to, doesn't have to make it in March. He can make it beforehand. Um, but he's gonna have a big decision. Do I permanently monetize all that debt? Or do I say here's your here's your bonds back, here's your mortgage back securities, give me my give me my credit back. That's a that you know that that'll cause a depression almost overnight. You know, you'll see banks seize up. So I don't I doubt that's going to happen. But we'll wait. I'm going to sit here every day, monitor the situation, and make the best decisions without an agenda and without bias. Okay, so thank you first off for sharing the specificity of how you're allocated right now. Um, that's always the most valuable thing that our guests can do, and not everybody's oh. willing to do it. So thank you for that. Um, and you're going to have to forgive me because you, you gave a, a really in-depth description of your model when you were on last time, which you mm -hmm. said was back in the spring. Um, and I'm not remembering the labels of each of your stages, but you have oh, okay, Sorry. you have these different oh, stages yeah. that the model says we're in, right? right. And you have um, the, uh, I guess, the deflation stage, right, which is kind of your, hey, this is the market correction phase. This is when you're batting out of the hatches, you're playing for safety. Um, that's where your four horsemen of the apocalypse come on in. We're not there. No. Um, are we in the stage prior to that? 
in your we mind? Were, we, we were, we were, so this, so thank you for remembering. So I have 20 component model, but that model spits out a diffusion index, which tells me where to invest along that spectrum between deflation and hyperinflation or stagflation. So there's deflation, disinflation, stasis, inflation, and hyperinflation. And if you understand where you are on that model, you'll understand, well, you know, in deflation, I want to overown treasuries. In stagflation and hyperinflation, I want to short treasuries, just to give you an example of how yeah. my thinking works. So you want to own tech, maybe in sector four, which is a healthy, a healthy kind of sort of moderate inflation. Um, you want to own utilities when you're you know, in sectors one and two. So disinflation and deflation. We were in sector two. I thought we were headed for sector one. That was when I was on your program. That was while Powell was bailing out the entire U.S. financial system. So right. I couldn't, I changed from that. I've been adding risk to the portfolio as I can, amazing myself, but not amazing the model saying, hey, there's not, there's really not much to, to get panicking about right now. You're cautious, but you're not in panic mode. You're on high alert, but you're, you didn't release the the safety on the gun, if I can use that analogy. <laughs> Got it. Okay. So in your, in your terminology, then we were in sector two, going to sector when it looked like it back it looked in like springtime. It. Now we've kind of gone back to sector three. Three but and you're, four. Three and three four. And four. Okay. Three and four. But, but it sounds like you're, you're still eyes wide open that we could sh quickly shift back the other direction. So we have, so base, so because of base effects, and the uh, rise of the oil price, it seems very clear to me that we're, we've at least stopped the disinflation for now. We're going to stay at you know sector three and sector four. That's why I added Cisco. I said to myself, you know, you want to have a little more a little more risk in the portfolio. I think we only stay there for a couple of months, two, because I think by October, November, December, sometime in Q4, we're going to see the resumption of disinflation to deflation. And I think we could have a credit event sometime in 24. So I, I'm trying to give you the timing that I see best right now. Of course, that's all subject to change. Like I said, I don't, I don't, I don't, thank goodness, I don't have to sit here and make my decisions, make this, you know, preset portfolio, put it on autopilot and then come back and check it in a month or two. I, that's not what my clients pay me for. And, and that would be irresponsible for me to do. So I'm going to check these components on it, the ones that update daily, daily weekly, monthly, some of them are even quarterly, and I'll make my decision based on that. But right now, if you're asking me, if, is now the time to short the market? No, it's not. It could be in the next couple of months. We'll have to wait and see. But, All right. but, but, but either way, 2000, again, and I will say it for maybe the 15th time, <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can edit some of it out. And I want to go out on a limb, as I always do. It's recession held in abeyance. It's not recession canceled. The, the soft landing scenario is BS. It's not going to happen. Okay. Um, so first off, Michael, thank you again. And um, you have open invitation to come back on this program anytime your model is telling you, hey, uh, we're seeing a material shift here. So I will. just know that this this platform is available to you anytime you want to get your, your, your message out about that. Um, so let's let's assume for a moment that it plays out the way you think it's most likely to play out. Okay. So let's say we're going into, you know, end of the year, beginning of 2024, and we'll start coming off. Right. Would you then, and I know your your exact decision obviously is going to be made based upon what the conditions are on the ground at that point in time. And we don't know what those are going to be yet, but but just a, play with me here for a second. Um, if they're the way you imagine they're most likely to, going to be, would 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 that scenario be kind of a four horsemen type scenario? Yes, yeah, so that's the four horsemen of the economic apocalypse, which is cash, U.S. dollar, treasury bonds, and shorts. Now, the the interplay in that, I do occasionally will own physical gold, never miners. Not never will I own a miner in sector four because sector sector one, excuse me, because sector one is deflation it's a liquidity event so sometimes gold is vulnerable so i'll i'll look at the charts and i'll see what you know what's happening at that time but right. i could enter i could interplay gold into that mix but it be on alert that if you don't own gold in that time frame and and it's and it's a liquidity event where these shadow banks we just been went through them 
Um, you see some of these hedge funds having pension funds having to dump gold, maybe some sovereign banks dumping gold. That's what happened in 08. It, it, it happens, but it's, it's extremely, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a truncated event because what happens on the other end of that is because these governments come in with their helicopter money and they will reliquify the banking system. And then you're going to see gold go to all time record highs, in my opinion, in sometime in 2024. I'll go out on a limb on that too. So if you want to get cute, if you want to call it cute, I don't like losses. Um, and so I will either help hold a very small position in gold or no position in gold. If I see a liquidity event, a liquidity event occur, it might not happen because don't forget, we still have the BTFB. It's or that, that facility is already in place. And I don't want to get, I don't want to have time to get into the, the major differences between, but I just want to get to one major difference because people might say, well, Michael, if the BTFB is already in place, why would we have this recession? Why would we have this liquidity event? We might not have liquidity event, but we would have a recession, Adam, because it's different. A, a, a liquidity um, event could be the result of BTFP because, again, Huey and the bank term funding program are completely different animals. Mm -hmm. One is, and I'll get, I'll make this quick, I promise. One is the, the central bank comes to a primary dealer and it tells them, give me your assets. I will permanently monetize them. They are no longer yours. Your mortgage-backed security, your commercial mortgage-backed security, your junk bond, that's part of the BTFB, your treasury, they are mine until they're no longer a problem, until you're willing and, and want to take them back, if ever. The BTFB is, uh, oh, one more point, sorry. And the, yeah. QE, and the QE program says, I just bought $85 billion of these type of bonds. Now you have Fed credit. Go out and buy them because they're going to be put in a massive bull market. Mm -hmm. Prices up, yields down. That is not what's happening with the BTFB. That is, you're in, you're in a bank. You're in trouble. I will bail you out for one year. You're going to have to take these assets back after that year and pay me interest. So the bank still has a huge problem. Those assets are still theirs. That is a major difference between the bank term funding program, the discount window, and QE. Okay, so, so two two questions. Two two questions for two based on two things you said there. Um, the first is uh, that's the way the BTFP is set up right now. Um, right. First off, if someone borrows today from it because they can, do you then have a year to pay that back, or I is that? I believe it's, I believe it's correct. Yes. It's a one year. So yeah. So it's one year from the, the date of your, your okay, asset. So, so, so in March, it's not like a hundred percent of it has to be paid back. It's whoever borrowed a year ago. Yeah. 90% of it. 90% of it. Cause that's where most of the borrowing occurred was in that first few weeks and months. So yeah, okay. it's a big, big, it's a, it's big, a big chunk. Big, yeah. It's a big chunk of it. I okay. I don't know if it's 90. Um, it's a high, it's a high number. Okay. And what do you think is more likely? Powell's a, a hard ass and says, <laughs> well, time's up, pay me back. Or he says, you know what? Everybody gets another year. Or or he put maybe fully monetizes it. I, I personally think that'd be, a, 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 well, I guess it depends on how bad the crisis gets. <laughs> but, so so you, answered your, you answered your own question perfectly, but I would answer it. It, it depends on the, it, the conditions extent at the time. So if we, are, if we have non-farm payrolls that are heading towards zero or in negative territory, and you see uh, credit spreads widening and, and and a lot of stress in the banking system, which is very possible. He, he might just say, you know what? The BTFB is really just QE. And we're going back into QE. Um, that could be a possibility. And again, that's a whole different dynamic for which I'm going to have to invest for. Um, but if things are okay, he might be stupid enough to, or, or smart enough. I don't know. I don't really know the adjective to put there. I, I think he was, I think it was, beyond the pale to even go down this road so quickly to bail out four banks. I think, it, you know, it, it's un-American, but he did it. So I, you know, I'm not going to tell him what to do. He's not going to listen to me anyway. Um, I'm not even sure he listens to this program. So I will wait. <laughs> I will wait to make that decision at the time. But I most likely dependent, of course, on the, the conditions at the time. If he had to make that decision today, I think he would say, here's your assets back and whew, watch what happens then. Wow. It'd be a short term so, decision. <laughs> it's so interesting. So, so you know, a lot of Fed watchers think, okay, Powell's playing for legacy here. He doesn't want to be another Arthur Burns. That's why he's, you know, being more hard nosed than previous Fed chairs have been, or even Powell was earlier in his tenure. Um, and so we're all just trying to guess, you know, 
what what Powell's going to do next, which is no way to run a financial markets where everyone's just trying to speculate on what one person or one small group <laughs> of people are doing, right? But it's what drives markets, right? Yep. <laughs> given given how bastardized the markets are. Yes. Um, but what's interesting is uh, Biden didn't appoint Powell, and Powell serves at the pleasure of the president. Trump has said, hey, if I get reelected, that guy's out, even though Trump put him in place. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's just interesting that we are really trying to solve the puzzle of what Jay Powell is going to do. He might not be around for all that much longer, yeah. right? I mean, they might put somebody else in there who's got a totally different constitution. I, well, first, just a for, I think it was I thought it was ironic that first Trump wanted to get rid of Powell because he was wasn't easy enough, and now he says he wants to get rid of Powell because he's too easy. Yeah, <laughs> that's his that's his train of thought. So um, yeah, I, yeah, he he might be uh, his tenure might be just about over. I don't know why he took the job again in the first place because you don't want to be around when this next recession hits because the chances of it being a very steep recession, you 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 just look at that yield curve and the steepness of it. That was. Ne- the, even in 2008, it was nothing, any any close to the the intensity of the duration or the intensity of the inversion or the duration of the inversion, nothing compared to what we saw today. So based up, upon that critical metric and that, that, that barometer of the economy, we're in deep doo-doo. And, it, and, it's, that's just, and that's not standing in isolation. That yield, inverted yield curve, its intensity and duration, is supported by many other metrics that I look at. And I mentioned a lot of them today. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, as we as we start to kind of begin to land the plane here, Michael, um, uh, always so great having you on this, this channel. Um, you're such a wonderful guest. You're so uh, incredibly generous in sharing not just your thinking and your expertise, but the specifics of how you deploy your uh, your portfolio in in which situations you know you make what uh, allocation decisions and again that's that's like you know pure gold to the viewers of this channel because they're all just regular people who are just trying to figure out okay how do I at a minimum not become collateral damage if Michael's right right <laughs> if we go into this recession uh, and a co- commensurate you know potentially thirty plus percent market correction how do I not get destroyed. Um, and then obviously they're trying to think about how do I grow my wealth over time so that I can, you know, achieve my life goals and things like that. So thank you for doing all that. Um, a couple of closing questions. I guess the first one, is there anything we haven't talked about yet that you think is germane to today's viewers who who have that constitution? Well, we've never had a situation where asset bubbles were this um, out of sync with the historical norms. If you look at home price to income ratios, not not home price, home prices are through the roof. We all know that. But home, even in relation to incomes, they have never been higher. Home price to income ratios are higher today than they were even in the previous peak of 2006. We saw what happened in that unsustainable environment when home prices dropped 33% nationally. It could happen again. Um, In that time frame, the Total market cap of equities as a percentage of the underlying economy was around 103%. Today, it's 165%. Again, we have these asset bubbles. They're they're breaking. The junk bond market has yet to implode. It will. Real estate market, yet to implode. It probably will. And the stock market is going to go down the same rabbit hole as well. That's, That's the big fear. And I don't see, other than... Other than the artificial um, Fed money printing, which is which is over, artificially low interest rates suppressed way below inflation, and massive QE, unlimited QE is the only thing that I know of that can keep that historical difference, that that trenchant gap between asset prices and with the historical free market forces would keep them. How do you keep that uh, gap that wide? by artificial means, and they are over. So watch out for the grand reconciliation of asset prices. Okay. And and, and I, I, uh, I sort of take from that, you know, the, your, your counsel then to people is, when it comes to their money, at least, is this is a time for conservatism. This is a time to prioritize defense. Don't get caught up in the narrative of AI has changed everything. And, you know, we've got a productivity miracle, uh, 
you know, donning right now. And uh, uh, there's going to be a no landing. So don't worry about recessions. Um, this, this is not what I don't hear saying is this is the time to really stretch for speculation here. This is the time really to be saying, hey, if a hurricane arrives, am I am I going to be OK? You know, Adam, if you look at price to sales ratios, they're all time record highs. Um, risk premium at our all time record lows. There's just this, there are times when you want to take risk. And there are times, you know, when you really want to load the boat up on equities, you know, when no one wants to own them, when there's no margin, when there's a low household ownership of stocks, when the risk premium is very high, when the price to sales ratio is closer to one, not, you know, where it is today, close to the three, two and a half, three. Uh, it's just, it, history is, is very accurate. It clearly states this is not the time that you want to get over your skis to try to chase a few stocks in the NASDAQ. Okay. And it sounds like, and correct me if this is wrong, but it, but hearing you talk about what you think is going to happen, it sounds like you think there are going to be some great opportunities for oh, yeah. prudent and patient investors to make great returns here. One of which may actually come in the breakage with the four horsemen, which is if you are out the long duration U.S. Treasury curve, you can make a lot of money on that appreciation while sitting in relative safety, which those opportunities don't come along all that much. And then you're nodding as I'm saying that. Um, and then um, uh, after that, the vibe I get from you, but please clarify, is once the washout has happened, there may be a great opportunity for people who are sitting on liquid capital that they've been able to preserve through the washout and deploy that at, at truly attractive valuations to set themselves up for good long-term growth potential. Do you agree with? I agree with everything you just said. I mean, I I look. I'm thinking about the long duration bonds like the TLT and the ZROZ that could be part of the palette that I use to invest with. Um, that has to be actively banished because if you're going to go into TLT w w to overcome all the things I mentioned, like high inflation and six percent GDP and Japan yield curve control and China defending their currency, blah, 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 you know, all those things that I mentioned before and the usual supply issuance. To overcome all that, you're going to need a recession and a, and a panic out of equities. People should be panicking out of equities. The market starts to, the, the, the economy starts to tank. People flood into the security of long duration treasuries. They could make a lot of money going out on the yield curve. But then you understand what's going to happen on the other end of that. Right, we we've been inculcated. This this playbook is going to be, you know, it, it's it's old and wrinkled and ri and ripped. He's going to come back with ZERP and QE, and at that point, if that occurs, I think you mentioned Fleckenstein also was talking about this. Um, if that occurs in the environment where we just exited nine percent not too many quarters ago, um, and inflation is still well above their target of two percent, well, it's not going to stop at nine. I mean, you've inculcated then to the market, you, you've taught by repetition over and over again that you can never fight asset bubbles and you can never provide investors with a real positive interest rate. Interest rate that is positive after you subtract inflation. Mm -hmm. and then And then you're going to have a problem with inflation like we've never had before in this country. So I would not want to be, I'd be sure, at, uh, my play is to go long TLT, or zeros for a while, and then short it when the time is right. Because I think those long rates are going to soar. Okay. All right. Um, well, look, as, as we begin to wrap up here, and, and Michael, in just a second, I'm, I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell people where they can go to learn more about you and your work and talk to you potentially if they want to learn more about you as a, as a potential money manager for them. Um, but uh, a question I didn't get to ask you last time that I think I've got a few minutes to, to get your thoughts on here is... Uh, you know, we talk off air uh, when we can. It's always wonderful. I know you to be a very thoughtful man, a very conscientious person. I think that comes across to any viewer here. Um, but, uh, you know, you, you, your business is, is helping people, you know, uh, create their financial futures, right? Create financial resilience, uh, create the returns they need to do the things they want to do in their life. Um, so money, very important to uh, a, a happy, self-fulfilled life, but it is not the only thing, right? And, you know, we're entering a period where um, 
hopefully people that are working with a financial advisor like you uh, can sort of surf the the uncertainty that's out there and hopefully do well through that. But we're, we're going to be entering a period of time, highly likely if what you think is going to happen, where, you know, the money might not materialize the way that that m- most people are hoping it's going to, right? And that doesn't mean that life is over, right? And so my, my question for you is just in terms of like your definition of like, you know, like what matters in life? What makes a rich life? Yes, money is a part of it, but it's not all of it. Like as you counsel people, um, both clients of yours, but just regular people like viewers of this channel, like, you know, what are some of the other things that people should be keeping their eyes on, you know, in, in their daily lives above and beyond just the money? Like, for example, you, you, you've given me great counsel when my mother was going through um hospice uh, and coming out of this world about, uh, or you know, leaving this world, um, about just the importance of family and good relationships, right? And, and making sure that those are the things that sustain us probably, in fact, more than, than the money does in the long run in terms of really nourishing us uh, as, as humans and, and bringing color and joy to our lives. Um, I'm just curious if you have any, any bits of counsel to share with the average viewer here about, again, like w- what makes a rich life in your book? Well, wow. thank thank you for the question, Adam. Um, I didn't expect that question, but I'm I'm glad I'm I have I'll answer it with alacrity. Um, you know, it doesn't matter that you have a Maserati or how many houses you have or how much millions you have in the bank at, at your deathbed. It's going to be your your relationship with your. What, what are your children going to think of you? Hmm. Um, um, and most importantly, what is your God going to think of you? And um, ha- have you lived up to your potential? I have a, I have two children and I, I've coached many kids, athletes. I always I always ask this question right off. I don't care if it's soccer or if it's baseball or if it's wrestling or if it's Taekwondo. I don't care what it is. Um, it, you have a responsibility on this earth to be the best person that God intended you to be. And that means you have to take life seriously and give it your all and give back the talents and, and make the most of them in, in this life. And 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 it's the love and respect that you give other people that means more than anything in this world. So I'm glad you asked the question. All right. Well, that's a great answer. All right. Well, as I promised, for people that have really enjoyed this conversation with you, and Michael, thank you for giving us so much time. We're coming up on the two-hour mark here. Thank you. <laughs> you really do leave it all in the field. Where can people go to follow you and your work? Uh, the website is uh, pentoport.com. Uh, I have an email address is mpento at pentoport.com. The office number is 732-772-9500. There's a podcast there called the Midweek Reality Check. Uh, it's $50 a year, but there's a five-week free trial. So you get a lot of my thoughts on the, the most uh, salient economic data and my analysis. Uh, some some portfolio analysis, but most of it is con- you know held for the clients. And if you have $100,000 a year, uh, $100,000 to invest, and you're a U.S. citizen, uh, please give us a call. And I want to thank you not only for a great interview, for, for a great channel. You're you're doing a great job, Adam. And I appreciate being a, a small part of what you're doing. And I thank you very much for the opportunity to come on again. Oh, Michael, you are a big part of this channel and a hugely popular guest. I uh, just can't thank you enough for all your participation, my friend. Um, and look, real quickly in wrapping up, as you mentioned earlier, um, Wealthion is having its fall conference, its fall online conference. Uh, It's not that far away anymore. It's a little bit over a month away. It's going to be Saturday, October 21st. And uh, the faculty this year just, it looks to be our best ever. Um, We've got uh, Lacey Hunt kicking it off, uh, talking about his overall macro outlook on the economy and what he expects the Fed to do from here. Uh, We've got the godfather of interest rates, Jim Grant, talking about where he sees uh, interest rates going in the future. We've got Michael Kantrowitz, uh, who'll be presenting on his HOPE framework with a big laser focus on the employment E uh, and uh, whether or not that is going to remain a bulwark against uh, recession. Uh, I know you've got lots of thoughts about that, Michael. Um, We're going to have Kyle Bass talking about the major Uh, geopolitical risks that are most likely to impact the markets next year. Uh, We then have Stephanie Pomboy. She's going to be talking about the uh, battle between the forces of inflation and deflation and how that's likely to unfold in 2024. Uh, We'll have Ivy Zellman there, highly respected 
uh, real estate uh, analyst. Uh, she'll be giving us her thoughts on where she sees the real estate market going. We'll then have live reaction to Ivy's presentation from Nick Jurley, who you mentioned earlier, Michael, uh, as well as housing analyst Amy Nixon. Um, we will have Michael Leibowitz from Real Investment Advisors there talking about bonds specifically, where he sees those headed over the next year and how uh, he thinks they might be played. That'll build off of what you talked about us early, talked uh, to us about earlier there, Michael. Uh, we'll have Rick Rule and he, Rick will be sharing his top picks uh, for the natural resources stocks that have his attention most right now. Uh, we'll then hear from Doomberg about uh, the global energy situation. He'll then be joined by Justin Hewn, and together they will do a deep dive into the uh, really interesting and emerging uh, opportunities to invest in uranium and in nuclear energy. And of course, we're gonna have our financial advisors there, the ones you see with me every week on this channel. We'll have the guys from New Harbor, uh, we'll have Lance Roberts, uh, and we'll have Jonathan Wellam there from uh, Rocklink up in Canada. One or two other uh, faculty members still to be announced uh, for this event. Um, but as you can see, it's an amazing lineup and it's only getting better. Uh, to learn more about the conference as well as to register for it, just go to Wealthion.com slash conference. Uh, a reminder that if you do so uh, quickly, you'll still be able to lock in the low early bird discount price. That's almost 30% off the full price of tickets. And if you are an alumnus of one of our conferences in the past, check your email inbox because you'll have a discount code from me that will give you an additional 15% off of that 30% that I mentioned earlier. Um, and uh, Michael, look, I can't thank you enough for coming on this channel. Folks, um, would love to have Michael come back on as soon as his model is telling us that something really important is underway. Uh, to help encourage Michael to do that, please do me a favor and let him know by hitting the like button, then clicking on the red subscribe button below, as well as that little bell icon right next to it. Uh, Michael, can't thank you enough. Uh, it is just always such a massive pleasure to have you on this channel. You leave everything on the field. You're really one of the best experts that we have the privilege of talking to here at Wealthion. Thank you, Adam.